Today's scripture reading is taken from 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared. We have seen it and testified to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to you to make our joy complete. This is the word of God. Is it on? Good morning, uh, brothers and sisters in Christ. Good morning. Okay, before we start, let us uh, commit this time to the Lord in prayer. Shall we bow our heads? Our God and our Father, we come this morning with uh, gratitude and thankfulness, even for the person of our Lord Jesus, in whom is manifested life eternal. And Father, even as we consider the words of uh, John the Apostle, we, Father, we just pray and ask that as we stand before you, on redemption ground with deep anticipation and eager expectation. Father, we just pray that you'll make your voice heard even to us, even this morning, even through your Holy Spirit. Father, we ask this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning, brothers and sisters in Christ. So today we are considering the topic of joy and the knowledge of God. And the reading was read just now from John, um, 1 John, actually, uh, chapter 1. Only four verses, a very short consideration. Um, let's look at it again in a little more detail. So I'll read the whole thing very quickly. Uh, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life. So John is saying here, we as the apostles, we have seen him, we have heard him, we have touched him. This life, verse 2, was manifested and we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you. Why? Why was this declared? Why is the Lord Jesus declared and proclaimed to us that ye also may have fellowship with us, with John, with the apostles, with Christians, and truly our fellowship is with the Father, with God himself, and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you that your joy may be full. So we're going to work our way backwards today. We'll start with verse 4. And these things write we unto you that your joy may be full. So the entire epistle is written for the sole purpose of making us joyful, all right? So that our joy will be full. Now that begs the question, what is that joy? And um, this is a slide about the overview of the entire um, consideration of the four verses we have today. We'll start with the purpose of fellowship. And um, even this morning, the AV team asked me, you know, is there something wrong with your slides? You know, uh, why is the first two missing? And no, there's nothing wrong with the slides. We are working our way backwards, okay? So we start from verse four, we'll go on to verse three, and then verses one and two. And we'll see the reason why we're doing that. So the purpose of fellowship, as mentioned, the real reason, the sole aim and goal is so that your joy may be full. So what is this joy? What is it? Um, is it something that is future? It, it possibly could refer to a future joy or is it referring to a present joy? And furthermore, you know, what's the source of this joy? You know, think of things that make you happy, all right? Um, say, sometimes people patting you on the back and say, you know, oh, well done, you know, uh, good job here for your work. Or maybe there's some success. Or maybe you say, okay, you know, um, I managed to complete a project successfully, right? Or, or sometimes maybe just even being in the presence of your loved ones, you know, that will bring you joy. All right, but here we're going to take a short break, okay? Um, there's something that um, my family and I were discussing recently. Uh, we are saying that Hari Raya is just around the corner. Uh, in fact, it's actually next month, uh, the weekend of the 22nd of April, around that weekend. And uh, that means that Ramadan is just around the corner. In fact, it's actually starting this Wednesday. And I was like, wow, you know, time really flies. And during the time of this fasting month, 
um, we tend to hear a lot of things, uh, especially if you're on the road. Um, who here listens to radio on the road? No one. Ah. Got lah, ah, got lah, okay. Like maybe like Light FM or Hits FM, you know, all right? And usually you will hear something like this during the month of Ramadan. For those who are not so well versed with VM, I have to apologize. It goes something like this. Keenakan buah kurma dari timur tengah Yusuf Tayu. Kelazatan buah kurma yang tiada bandingannya Yusuf Tayu. Buah kurma Sofia, Wasim, Safina dan banyak lagi. Etc. Etc. And we will go with the Yusuf Tayu over and over again. All right. Who has heard that before? Got lah. Huh? Okay. Huh? So it's not foreign. Huh? If not, some people will say that I'm speaking in tongues up here. All right. Now, Yusuf Tayub is a brand of medjool dates. So I think people know what dates are. It's not the kind that you go out one on one with another person. It's 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 a, it's a type of uh, fruit, sweet, all right? And what you see here in the photo is a date palm. It's very common in the Middle East, you know, usually if you watch any of those Middle Eastern movies, you'll see this um, tree pop up from time to time. Now, what I want you to notice about this tree is that it's in the desert, right? And the leaves are green, and the fruits are there. So how is this tree green and fruitful when there is no water, or at least rain is very uncommon. So the reason for this is because date palms actually have very deep roots. And in this uh, study, they were saying that 85% of the roots go up to two meters, which is really not that deep, but the rest goes up to at least six meters. And it has been documented to go as far as 25 meters, very deep underground, where water can be found. So rain is not common, but can be found deep underground, where this external environment is dry. And then you're going to ask me, William, what does this have to do with joy? So remember just now we were asking about what joy is. Is it based on external circumstances? Yes, mostly it is. But the joy that we are talking about today in 1 John is a joy that is not based on external circumstances. It's different. Why? Because it depends on God. And this is the fullness of joy that's ever present. Think of it as a water that is, a, a source of water that is underground that is ever present and only needed for you to reach out for it. A fullness of joy that's ever present, it's everlasting, it's always there. But what is it based on? Remember, it is based on your fellowship with God. It's possible to have this everlasting joy. It's talked about in Psalm 1 verse 3, uh, Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 8. So let's take a look and see. This is a joy that always flows. And Psalm 1 verse 3 says this, And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. You see what are the, um, the, the prerequisites in a sense. What, what are the uh, requirements he will meditate on the word of God day and night. They bring forth fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, shall not turn green, uh, shall not turn brown, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. So he has that joy. Jeremiah 17, verse 8, very similar. Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord, in whose hope the Lord is. For he shall be as a tree planted by the waters, and that spreadeth out her roots by the river, and shall not see when heat cometh, but her leaf shall be green. Same thing, in the time of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. So this is the kind of joy that we are looking at today. And it's not um, happiness in every single circumstance, if you think about it this way. Um, think of it by using an example. You know, is, it, is it happiness saying that, oh, no matter what comes in life, I'm going to be happy. My mother broke her leg, you know, praise the Lord. Or, or my father died, praise the Lord. Is it, is it a kind of happiness some people will say, you know, you're crazy lah. It's, you know, if, if, if an external person looks at this and say, you know, what kind of Christian is this? Always happy, you know, no matter what. Only, only a person who is in an asylum will be like that, right? So the joy that's mentioned here is, is a different kind. It's joy in spite of grief. We can be, yes, 
thankful and praising the Lord, but not happy at the same time. It's, yeah, we, we, it's possible for us to be discouraged. And the Lord Jesus, um, he was very discouraged. You, you, in fact, you'll find that he's the only man that's ever discouraged so much and yet never depressed. He, he saw Lazarus' um, tomb. He wept. He grieved in the face of weakness. And it's not, there's nothing wrong with that. But this joy is not based on anything in this world. It is based in God alone. And what if our external sources are removed one by one? Where do we draw our delight from? Are we affected by the things that happen around us? I think it's quite common. There was a recent announcement, uh, not announcement, in the news, um, Silicon Valley Bank, SVB, you know, has collapsed. You know, and, and how does that affect us? You know, will it affect our joy? So let's move on. Um, the Lord gives us a way out. Psalm 16, verse 11, in your presence is fullness of joy. So what is the source of this joy? We are saying that it is found in God, but how? Now, I'm going to bring up a picture that brings up your dopamine levels. Okay? Everyone sees this, everyone gets happy. I saw so, I was like, wow. But as you see money, Malaysian ringgit, right? Now, I'm going to pose a question to every one of you. I'm very early in my career, so I can't say much about it, but I'm sure you can. How to find money, okay? How to find money. So keep this answer in your mind, okay? I'll give you five seconds. Think of a way to find money, all right? Now, if you have your answer with you, just think in your mind, huh? is it this? Huh? Is it finding money quite literally on the floor, you know? So if you tell me, say, William, uh, uh, if I come up to you and say, you know, I want you to teach me how to find money. Okay, you just go to the floor, find, and, and pick. Not really, right? Okay. Now, what's the point of this? What I'm trying to say here is this, that things, that we, some things that we find are byproducts of a process, and money is one of those things. Money is really a byproduct of value creation or a service that's provided. Think of it that way, all right? You can make money by selling something or, you know, um, helping someone out with something else. But you can never really find money just by finding for it. And God's joy is very similar. Now, finding joy is a byproduct of something else. And... The Lord tells us that blessedness and joy is never a result of pursuing it directly. It's not something that you can find and say, I want to find joy and therefore I will find it. It's a byproduct of pursuing something else. And there's even better proof for this. Think about it this way. When the Lord spoke in the Beatitudes in uh, Matthew chapter 5, has he ever said, blessed are they who are finding blessedness? or hunger and thirst after blessedness. Not really. The Lord will always say, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the, those who are meek, blessed are, who are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. It's always about something else. And then the blessedness and joy comes as a side effect. So the purpose of fellowship, now coming back to verse 4, we are saying, and these things write me unto you, that your joy may be full. Where does this come from? And this comes from fellowship. That's in verse 3 which we will look at as well. And it comes from two things. One is very explicitly mentioned in verse 3, that's fellowship, to know God and His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And the second one is implicit. It's not so obvious in the first four verses, but you'll see that as, um, you know, uh, you study First uh, John uh, more and more. It's assurance. It's to know, not just Him, but to know that we know Him. Know that we know God. All right, that's also found in First John um, chapter 5, verse 13. And to prove the point, so first and foremost, what is know? All right, we'll look at the second one and then we'll move back to fellowship and um, look at that in more detail because that's where our concentration is. To know is really, you know, this is the definition, um, to be aware, to, yeah. I think everyone knows what know is. And in the whole book, you can see that these are the mentions of know we find that there are 25 mentions in 1 John alone, which is roughly more than 10% of all the mentions in the New Testament. So there's a lot about knowing in 1 John. It's not so much about feeling that we are saved, feeling that we know God. John talks about knowing. 
It's a certainty. No, 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 no. Okay, and First John chapter 2, verse 3, and hereby do we know that we know Him. I know it sounds confusing, but never mind. Um, we'll leave that for another time. All right, let's move on to the, the actual portion of this um, study. So fellowship, what does it mean to know God and to know His Son, Jesus Christ? So what is fellowship? Which brings us to our next point, but let's read that verse together. That which we have seen and heard, Declare we unto you why that ye also may have fellowship with us, with fellow Christians, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. I'll concentrate this morning on that second part, the latter part of this verse. Not so much on the fellowship with other Christians, that in itself is a huge topic alone, but let's concentrate on that second part. So we have already considered the purpose of fellowship is so that our joy may be full, and now let's look at the participants of fellowship. Who is involved? What is it? Now, um, in terms of participants, there are people who are involved in this fellowship. But before we talk about who is in, let's talk about what. So fellowship, the Greek word is koinonia. And it really means to have something in common, to communicate, to have communion, to have, to, to have distributed. Uh, it's... To share. That's the idea of fellowship. You share in something together. You have something in common together with the other person. So the word fellowship is used a lot in New Testament. We can have fellowship with darkness as well, um, which we shouldn't have. So what is it? Why is it so important? Why is it that we need to have in common? Now, I think we all know this movie, right? Um, very famous, uh, at least uh, in our time. It's called The Lord of the Rings, The Fellowship of the Ring. So there are these little, small, tiny little people who gather together and say, you know, find other people who are maybe a little bit bigger than them and say, okay, you know, we need to destroy this ring. You know, this ring is an evil ring. You know, if anyone wears this, you know, he can find the most evil person in the land. We must destroy this ring. So they had something in common then what did they have in common? They had a common goal. So this begs the question, um, can we have fellowship with people who are outside of church? In a sense, yes, because we can have things in common with them, right? You can have fellowship with people who um, enjoy music, um, or you can have fellowship with people who enjoy food. But is that really the fellowship that John is speaking about? The fellowship that we have with God and with fellow Christians? Now, let's go back to the Garden of Eden. A long, long, long time ago, before Middle Earth, Adam and Eve, they had perfect fellowship with God. And how do we know this? In Genesis chapter 3, verse 8, it says there that the Lord God was walking in the garden. He was walking together with Adam and Eve. It wasn't something that was unusual for that time. We don't see God walking in a garden anywhere here. You know, you can go to your garden, you know, near your taman, and you won't find God walking there. And the idea of walking here, maybe it's used anthropomorphically, that's to say that it's just an, um, it's not in a literal sense, but the idea is that they have fellowship. They had something in common in that time. Adam and Eve communed with God face to face. They spoke. Even the, the Lord made himself known. He says, where are you? He asked Adam. Adam can speak back to God. There was that fellowship. But unfortunately, that fellowship was broken. And in that due to sin. Sin is the very thing that separates us from God. So when we talk about sin and what death is, death really is just the separation between God and man. It's just that due to sin. For the wages of sin is death. We are separated from God. And that's what happened in the garden. That fellowship was broken. So we have an idea of what that fellowship is. It's to have communion. It is to have something in common to share with God. Now moving on. What are the things then that we share in common with God, right? So what you see is a Venn diagram. I'm not sure if everyone has seen it. It's a very mathsy sort of diagram, but it shows an intersection where there is something, there is an, uh, something in common. So 
That is the idea of fellowship. And what do we share with God? What do we hold in common with God? And Tim Keller puts it this way with um, some of the older Christians. Um, we share in God's life. That's number one. We share in His life. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4, we share in God's nature. We, we are made partakers of the divine nature. We share in His interest. We now have the mind of Christ if we become Christians. And we also share in His communication. John chapter 20, verse 17. We'll look at this in more detail. But the idea here is that these are the things that we share um, with God. So what do we share in His life? Now let's talk about life. When we talk about life um, here, it's really referring to the nature that is within us. That has changed. The moment we become Christians, the moment we accept the Lord Jesus, as a, the, the moment we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, we take on a new nature. Now, can anyone tell me who is the guy on the left? Anyone? I think it's a, Tom Hanks. I hear, I hear Tom Hanks, all right? On the right is his son, Colin Hanks, okay? So Tom Hanks has a number of sons, and this is one of them. And you, see, you can see they look very similar, all right? So you can see that Colin inherited certain features that the father has, the eyes, the nose, the mouth. They look similar. There is an inheritance. Usually when we talk about inheritance, we're talking about, you know, property, you know, like wow, house, you know, um, you know, cars. Or, but here when we talk about inheritance, we're talking about nature, the nature of the, the characteristics of that person. And it's the same thing with us. If we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, to them gave He power to become sons of God, children of God, right? And if we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are now made sons of God. Uh, sons of God, sorry. So we then have something that we have in common with God. We have something of His nature. Be holy for I am holy. There is a nature that we have inherited from God. It goes beyond just believing and applying what we have learned. We are sharing something with Him. And C.S. Lewis puts it this way. It's a very long quote, but the phrase that we look at is a bright stainless mirror. We become a reflection of who Christ is. When Christ learned to forgive people, learned He obedience by the things which He suffered, He forgave others, we can become a reflection like Him if we were to forgive others. So that is the nature that we can take on if we believe on His Son. So we have already mentioned in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4, whereby are given to us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers, fellow heirs of the divine nature. It's not to say that we are going to become God himself, right? We don't have God's power, but we have his nature. So in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, it is not I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. We sing that song all the time, right? Yet not I, but through Christ in me. It's Christ who lives in us now, not so much ourselves. We have died to ourselves, but Christ is now living in us. Now, let's move on to the next one. We share in his interests. We share in his mind. So we get his mind, his heart, and his priorities become our priorities. We'll look at an example of this. So in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16, we have the mind of Christ. Now, consider two things. Are we religious people or do we have fellowship with God? So let me ask you in this sense, this question. Religious people only go to God at critical times. Or there's a time of need, you know, okay, I need to go to God and pray. Or, you know, especially if you, if you see our, our friends who are not Christians, when something goes wrong, you know, oh, we must go to the temple, right? Are we religious? If something goes wrong, we must go to church. We must pray. Or are we actually having fellowship, something in common with God? Are we sharing with Him on a continual basis not just only in times of need. It's in a sense, we are like putting God on like a pair of spectacles through which we now see everything. Do we have fellowship with Him? Do we share His interest? So let's look at an example. Now, if you are within your family, think of anyone that you're close to, whether it's your father, your mother, your son, your daughter, you know, your sister or your brother. Think of someone that you're close to and that you actually speak to all the time. 
Somehow, if you spend enough time with that person, you get to know how that person thinks. You start to have an idea. Oh, you know, um, when he sees that, um, you know, a record player, I know he will say, okay, you know, that's a very nice record player. I want that. Or, you know, when you see Cha Siu Siu, you're always like, wow, sure that person say nice one. So you start to know what the other person thinks. And the dynamic is very similar, but far more profound with God. It's the same thing. If we have fellowship with God, we share in His interests, you start to think a bit like Him. It's not to say you are God, again, you're, you're not Him, but you start to think like Him. So the things that we know are wrong now turns our stomach. It's not something that we find palatable anymore. Oh no, you know, I, I, why would I want to do that? Because God would not be happy. He, won't, he would not be pleased. Then things that make Him sad will grieve us. If we look outside and we see our, our friends who are not believers, you know, what is their future? We, we grieve, right? If you hear someone who has passed away and say, is that person a believer? No, not really, you know. Um, he never professed anything, you know. There was no life in that person. You grieve, you feel sad, you know. Another soul lost. So things like light and darkness and sin and grace and redemption and eternity become very common in your view now, you know. It's something that you think about on a more constant basis. So we have thought about how we share in his life. We have thought about how we share in his interests. Now let's talk about how we share in his communication. Now I'm going to bring your attention to uh, that same actor that we saw just now, Tom Hanks again, all right? Now, I'm going to ask another question for all the moviegoers here. Do you know what movie this is called? Anyone would like to give it a try? Cast Away. I hear Cast Away. Okay? Very good. Now, in this movie, Cast Away, what happens is that there was this man who is um, part of a FedEx... Um, he, he was a FedEx delivery man. All right, he was on a flight, uh, and apparently something happened over Malaysia, you know. Um, as with all other planes, Malaysia is very well known for our planes, right? Um, but nothing right about them. So what happened was this plane crashed, and he was marooned on this island um, with a few delivery boxes, etc., etc. And one thing that he found was this ball. Now, can anyone tell me what is the name of this ball? Wilson, fantastic. Now I'm going to ask you, what's the name of the main character? No one can tell me, right? Everyone remembers Wilson, but no one remembers the main character's name. Let's call him Tom Hanks as usual, okay? But I got Wilson, all right? And Wilson is indeed correct, all right? So that's Wilson. Why is he named Wilson? It's because he's named after a brand of that ball. So what happened if on this island was when he... He, he was the lone survivor. There was no other survivors. He was the only one. And he felt really, really lonely. So he took this ball, and then he also injured himself along the way. It was a very gory movie, and there was blood all over. And what happened is that he actually hit the ball away, and that stain, he actually just painted a face on it, and he called the name Wilson. Because out of his loneliness, he started finding a companion. So Wilson became Tom Hanks' companion throughout the movie, and he's actually very famous. Now, think about it this way. For those who've watched the movie, you know that Tom Hanks always talks to Wilson. He's always communicating with Wilson, or, or is he? Is he really communicating with Wilson? And in a sense, at the risk of sounding flippant and casual, sometimes speaking to God feels like talking to a Wilson. It feels that way, right? Uh, there's no answer that comes back. You're just talking and it's like you're talking to thin air, you know, like... Is God really listening? Does God really hear me? How can my prayers go unanswered for so long? I think it's a common experience that we all have. Talking to a Wilson, it feels that way, all right? But the Bible tells us that God hears. In Isaiah chapter 59, verse 1, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, or His ear heavy, that it cannot hear. God hears. In Exodus, we read of God hearing the cry of His people. The cries of my people have come to me. That's why He told Moses, and I want to deliver them. I want to save them out of Egypt because He heard. So it's not to say that God doesn't hear. God hears. Now, the other thing is that in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, we are told that we need to have faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please Him, to please God, for He 
For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You must believe that if you were to diligently seek God and his face, that you will find him. And God makes that promise as well. And ye shall seek me and find me. This was made to the Israelites, but the principle remains the same. And I will be found of you when you shall search for me with all your heart. So God hears. We may sound like we are talking to Wilson, but it's definitely not a Wilson. God hears. In fact, he's looking at us right now and he's hearing us right now. Any prayers that you have. So let's move on. The communication is, what is it? It's an interchange of ideas and feelings. It's a two-way exchange. That's what fellowship is. It's not one way. It's not talking to a ball one way, but you get to receive in return. Okay? So there is some dynamics that goes on. We will not go into the details of what communication really is, but it's also subject to degree. Sometimes there's um, hostility. Sometimes there's intimacy. Sometimes there's enjoyment. Um, Tim Keller uses the example of marriage again in here. You know, I, I can't say because I'm not married, but in that experience from what he says, you may know the other person um, very well. But being married to the other person, the fellowship with that person can change. There are days where you can be happy with that person and days, you know, you can be so annoyed and say, why did I marry this person? This, this is the idea that he gave. So this, this is, it's subject to degrees. And, and God is the same. We have fellowship with him. There are days we may feel he is like alienating us. He's so far away. But there are days we enjoy his presence and we know that he's near. We pour out to him and he pours out to us two ways. And I'm going to use another example later on. Um, but here is about us communicating with God. It's an upload and a download. Us to him, if we have received the Lord Jesus Christ and the mind of Christ is growing in us, we would naturally want to pray right? We'll automatically just find time to pray. And, and we'll see exactly how later on. And, and from him to us, God speaks to us as well. And I would like to talk about this in further detail. Have we ever sensed his presence? Knowing that he's really there with us. Every Christian, I believe, there has been a time in your life that you can say with certainty, there has been a time he has shown, he has manifested himself to me, not, not physically show himself, but to just show himself in small little glimpse, in, in a still small voice, in just a meditation of scripture. And that's when we know that he's speaking to us. When we meditate on his word, certain truths get large, certain truths get big. Certain things we understand and like, wow, there is an aha moment. That's when God speaks to us. The truth begins to shine. And that's how God makes His presence known. We'll talk about this in a little more detail. Manifestations of reality is not just knowing about the Lord Jesus Christ. It's knowing Him. Do, do you know God personally? It's a personal relationship. Fellowship, not just belief. It is not just an intellectual understanding, yes, you know, yeah, I believe. It's more than that. The truth begins to shine. In John chapter 16, we are told that the Holy Spirit will take off mine. He'll take my words and he will glorify me. And surprisingly, he didn't say he'll take new words and then glorify the Lord Jesus. He'll take my words, already existing. Every part of the Bible that we have is about the Lord Jesus. It points to him. He doesn't give you new words. He actually just takes the existing ones and he makes it new to you. So practically, what does this mean? You ask me, oh, William, you know, this is all very airy-fairy, very theoretical. Practically, what does it mean? So we are told that, yes, we have to pray, pray without ceasing. And, and, and this term, pray without ceasing, can sound very uh, unrealistic, all right, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17, pray without ceasing. Does that mean that even, you know, everywhere I go, every single time, I must be praying to God? And I don't think that's the, the idea behind it. The idea is that do not cease, do not stop, as in don't have a season of praying and then stop. Continuously pray in that sense, not to say that you must pray nonstop. In Nehemiah chapter 2, right, Nehemiah was a cupbearer to the king Arcturus, and he uh, the, before the king, he was a cupbearer, and he was sad in his presence, and, and the king noticed, you know, it's like, ah, why are you sad? 
Um, and, and, you know, Nehemiah, he was actually very troubled about his land, the people that were in exile. And Nehemiah replied and said to him, you know, but, uh, the, the king, sorry, the king asked Nehemiah, what, what is your request? What do you want? And for a second there, you notice in verses 3 or 4, Nehemiah prayed. So I prayed to God. So that's a picture of, on the right-hand side of Nehemiah before the king. And I prayed to God. So if you think about it this way. Did he pray in the sense that he tells the king, wait, king, I'm going to go and pray for a day and I'll come back to you. Or say, wait, king, I'm going to pray. I'll come back to you in um, one hour. You, you see the pattern. Or did he say, you know, king, just wait, let me go and pray for half an hour, etc., etc. He straight away answered the king. So the idea here is that Nehemiah actually prayed a very silent and very quick prayer. Lord, help me to answer the king. And that's just pretty much it. That's what we can deduce from the passage. And that's what it means to pray continuously. So 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 15 tells us that we should study to show ourselves approved unto God. 2 Timothy chapter 3 16, all scriptures is given. We need to have the word of God in our life. Why? Because that's how God has fellowship with us. John chapter 20 verse 17. The Lord Jesus is the one who restores that fellowship that was once broken in the Garden of Eden. Look at the last part of that verse. I ascend unto my Father and your Father. I ascend unto my God and your God. It's the first time he's making such a profound statement. And have you ever considered why? He's now saying that my Father is now your Father, my God is now your God, and it's only possible because I have died for your sins. And now that I've been raised again from the dead, I have justified you, and now you can have access to God himself. You can have fellowship with him. He was forsaken so that we can be heard. He says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He was forsaken so that we can be heard. Now, this two-way communication is not just now possible to say your prayers, we can boldly approach and have this interactive communion with God, two-way communication. And sometimes we can ask, is he listening? Do you know when he's listening to you? Do you know when he's counselling you? Do you know that he's showing you things? Or is there, do you know that there's an exchange going on? Have you ever felt that in your life when you pray and he answers? It takes time, but have you felt it before? Is there a personal interactivity in our prayer life? Is there this personal fellowship? Is it passive or interactive? Is it like a subscription? Oh, I subscribe to Netflix, you know. Um, is our religion flat, you know? Is, is it like a subscription model? I just tune in, you know, and that's it. Or do we really know him? We're talking a lot about interactivity these days, you know, with your phone. It's very interactive, right? Two ways. And is that our case with God? Now let's move on to the last section. Before we close, First John chapter one verse four. That which we that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen. John is giving a testimony. We as the apostles, we have seen, we have heard, we have touched. The prerequisite of fellowship. We need to do something before this. What is the prerequisite? And that is to believe what the apostles have said about the Lord Jesus. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables. Peter says. But we have made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus, but were eyewitnesses. They were eyewitnesses. What we see, I want you to see. What we have heard, I want you to hear. That's what John and Peter were saying. It's an objective reality with a subjective experience. What does that mean? So first, we have to believe in the Lord Jesus. Now, Christianity refuses to be categorized as a left-brain or right-brain religion, in a sense. Why? Because it's neither fully just intellectual and neither is it just fully experiential. Usually, it will lean to one of two. But it's both. Why? God can be known experientially. We'll talk about the intellectual part. Moses says, I want to see your glories in Exodus chapter 33. I beseech you, please, Lord, show me your glory. This is what I want to do. I want to know you and I want to know you intimately. I want to know you as a person. But God says, that will kill you. No man can see me at any time and live. And so God should say, I'll show you my back parts. Just the back. And the Lord Jesus makes this possible for 
us. What Moses wanted is now made possible because he has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ has made this glory shine, shown, seen in our hearts. We now can have that personal connection with God. It was what Moses wanted. In fact, it's what God wants as well for the Father's seek of such to worship Him. So it's necessary for you to believe first before you can experience fellowship with Him. Why? Because the mind must be filled with the truth of the Word of God before it descends into the heart. Now that is fellowship when that happens. When you understand the truth of God's Word, it descends into your heart. God is speaking to you. That's his voice. Like in Luke chapter 24, there were two on the road to Emmaus. It becomes real. So the two people who were walking with the Lord Jesus, they asked, did not our heart burn within us when he opened to us the scriptures? We have to go to the truth. You have to contemplate it. You have to meditate on it. You have to reflect on it, submit to it. The truth is where we will find God's fellowship until it starts to catch fire in our hearts. And it can even happen now. If you have already accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your saviour, this fellowship is now possible even for you. First Peter 1 verse 8, this is that joy unspeakable. It brings us back to the reason why this letter was written, so that you might have joy. Remember that this fellowship is based on truth. The, way, the Lord Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth and the life. Notice the second part of that verse, which is not up there. No man cometh unto the Father, but by me, through me. The truth is the way for us to know God. So this is where the, in, the intellectual part comes in and it combines together with the experiential. If the Lord Jesus Christ, he really did come, he really lived, he was seen, he was heard, and John declares that, there's a reason for it. The purpose of the gospel and everything that the Lord Jesus Christ did the sole purpose was so that you and I can have fellowship with God. It's the very purpose of the declaration of the gospel. It's not just a belief in God. We don't become Christians just because, yes, I believe that the Lord Jesus is the Son of God. Yes, I, died. I believe He died for me. We can believe that. But is that really eternal life? And we'll look at the, the definition of it. The aim of the gospel, the goal of everything the Lord Jesus did was so that you and I can have this fellowship with God. So we will say sometimes that, oh yeah, eternal life, it results in fellowship with God. But have you ever considered what eternal life is? If you think about it, eternal life is, by the very definition, fellowship with God. It is what it consists of. It's this living relationship with God. And if we haven't even experienced it, we could say we haven't even begun to live. What is this eternal life? And this is eternal life. John chapter 17, verse 3. The Lord Jesus gives us the example, uh, the, the definition that they might know thee, they, they might know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. It's not know about you, it's to know you. That's the idea that the Lord Jesus is presenting. Life eternal is a relationship with God. It's a living relationship with God. So, how do we get this joy in fallible? We have talked about it. We have to know him and his son. We have to know that we know, so that assurance, but that comes later. So how do we know? It's not just an objective, it's a subjective experience. We've talked about it and it results in fellowship in that eternal life. That's how we get that joy. Now that brings us to two implications. The first one is, it's a test. So test ourselves. Do we really have that fellowship with God? So we should approach this verse with fear and trembling. Many people will spend their lives, you know, saying that they want to defend the truth of the gospel and they believe, you know, that Jesus died for them, but they don't really know what it means to live with God, to walk with Him. There was no inner spiritual life. If Christianity is just a set of rules and religion, um, uh, uh, just about compliance, there is no inner transformation, no inner life, no inner change, then it is really just religion and not really a living relationship with God. Truth must penetrate the heart as a seed must penetrate the ground for us to be born again. But implication number two, it's not just a test, it's also an encouragement. God is not trying to play hide and seek with us. He's not trying to play peekaboo, you know. God is wanting to have that fellowship with us. Sometimes, you know, it can be because our, we, we lack spiritual discipline, you know, there's a lack of concentration. But 
God wants it. He has done everything He can to make sure you have this with Him. John chapter 4, the Lord seeketh those as such to worship Him. We'll skip the example of um, forgiveness. Let's take a look at William Cowper's hymn. In holy contemplation, the second um, stanza on the right-hand side, we sweetly then pursue the theme of God's salvation and find it ever new. How do we find this fellowship? It's through meditation. Is it this kind of meditation? Not really. Okay? The meditation that the scripture speaks about is in holy contemplation, not emptying your mind, but filling your mind is the other way around. It's meditation on His Word. The Word of God right in front of us is the very key to understanding, to have fellowship with God. So, you have to study it and you have to pray. It's somewhere in between this meditation, this holy contemplation. We sweetly then pursue the theme of God's salvation and find it avenue. It's something that is new. There's a list of questions here, you know, that you can ask yourself, you know, how can I praise Him? Only since I have to confess, you know, how do I know Him better? In the interest of time, we'll skip this. Martin Luther's meditation is very similar. He takes a passage and he meditates on every word. He takes the Lord's Prayer. He will say like, okay, you know, our Father which I have heaven. Okay, our. I have to thank God, you know, that I have fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Father, now I have this relationship with you. So the Holy Spirit makes it real to him because he really wanted it. Now let's ask a question to ourselves before we close, before we sing our final song. I like to have fellowship in Britain, but I don't know how. It's simply going to him and say that I thirst. I'm not having fellowship with you, and I want that relationship with you. Study the Word of God, contemplate it, and enjoy it. Be like blind Bartimaeus. And what did blind Bartimaeus do? He sat down where the Lord Jesus was passing by. Do we sit down where the Lord Jesus is passing by? And then what did he say? What did he cry? He said, Lord, have mercy on me. He says, Lord, I need you. It's as simple as that. Sit down together with the Lord in holy contemplation on his word. Pray, Lord, have mercy on me. Lord, I need you. Seek him and know him. And there you will find your joy is full in his fellowship with God. Now that is the conclusion of our consideration this morning. Before we sing our final song, shall we just commit this time to Lord in prayer. Our Father, we come before you with thanksgiving again that we can know you through the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that we can have this living relationship with you, this fellowship with you, and we pray that through this fellowship, our joy may be full. We pray, our Father, that we may be transformed by your truth as we see Christ even in the Scriptures. Father, we ask this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So as we sing this song, Lord, I need you. Let us consider what blind Bartimaeus said. Do we need him? Are we asking him to have mercy on us? Shall we rise to sing? Sin, but...
is Christ in me. Sing where you are. Yes, where you are, Lord, I am free. Holiness is Christ in me. First John chapter 5, verse 20, and we know that the Son of God is come and have given us an understanding that we may know Him that is true. And we are in Him that is true, even in His Son, Jesus Christ. And this is the true God and eternal life. And shall we all say, Amen. The meeting is now over.